a follow-up to some of the immigration uh, news from over the break. Does anybody around here think that the southern border is secure? What I can tell you is this is a president has been working since day one uh, to work on border security, uh, to make an immigration a priority. That's why he put forth a comprehensive immigration uh, reform plan legislation. And here's, here's the thing. As the president is coming forward and trying to come up with solutions, the difference here is that you have Republicans, as you know, who are doing political stunts. And, you know, and we've called that out over and over and over again. And the president is willing, is willing to work uh, with Congress, Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, to work on these issues that matter to the American people. Uh, but this is an issue that the president has taken very, very seriously since day one of his administration. But roughly 7,000 migrants crossing every day illegally. Does the White House believe the border is secure? Hey, look, I've told you what we have done, what we have made this a priority uh, to make sure. Done. Are they working? Uh, to make sure that there's border security measures. And look, 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 here's the thing, Peter. The president has taken historic actions, right, that no other president has been able to do. When you think about the 23,000 agents uh, that we, he has been able, uh, we have been able to put out there to deal with uh, the issue that we're seeing at the border. And that is something that he did without a lot of Republican support. Right? Make sure that we are dealing with a real issue. When you think about uh, the smugglers, really putting a plan in place that we deal with the smugglers, right? And we have to be very careful here, Peter, on how we talk about this. Because if we talk about it in a way that is misinformation, then it helps the smugglers. And so these are the issues that the president has taken incredibly seriously. And again, I will say this, I just said it moments ago, he's willing to work with Republicans, he's willing to work with Democrats, he's willing to work with ind independents to work on this issue, to move forward with his comprehensive plan that he put forward on day one of his administration. And another topic with the new Could you tap into funds from the bipartisan infrastructure law, for example, to try to make some of those upgrades that you're talking about. Well, we'll see, uh, we'll see what the after action uh, report shows. I uh, don't want to get ahead of that as far as any funding and what needs to happen next. Okay. Thank you, Kareem. First, does President Biden have confidence in Transportation Secretary Buttigieg? Yes. Why? Because Secretary Buttigieg is a, uh, is he respects uh, the secretary and the work that he has been doing. Uh, you have seen the secretary on TV. You have, heard, you have spoke, probably spoken to him uh, yourself, and they are doing everything that they can to make sure that the experience uh, that uh, Americans have uh, uh, is a good one. That's why they've held the uh, airlines uh, accountable. You've seen the, the, the secretary do that over and over again. And we understand. We understand what, uh, what Americans have been going through these past couple of months. That's why the secretary has been very clear uh, on uh, making sure that they are held accountable, has put in uh, processes in place to make sure that that uh, occurs. And yes, the president has confidence in, in Secretary Buttigieg. And then on these documents, how could anyone be that irresponsible? It, isn't that what this president says about mishandling classified documents? The president spoke to this personally. He spoke to this personally. He, again, he believes that uh, classified documents and information should be taken seriously. He takes them seriously. And he was surprised it's, it's to learn by any, any records. Have been. I disagree. I disagree. Here's what happened. Here's what happened once then his why is there a Justice Department? Well, let me, let me explain to you the process. Here's what happened when uh, his lawyers found out that the documents were there. They immediately turned them over uh, to their archives. But they were but there. But they the immediately them, turned them over they, to the they archives. They did the right thing I'm not gonna I'm not out. gonna go into specifics, but I'm going I, what I am reiterating to you is what you heard from the president yourself. Peter, uh, which is how he saw the process and how he respects and truly uh, uh, respects and takes this very seriously, and when he knew uh, and how surprised he was by it, and the actions that, uh, the, the right actions that the lawyers took. Again, this is under, this is under investigate, is, is under review by the Department of Justice, and we're going to let that process continue. How can President Biden be trusted moving forward with America's secrets? Because his lawyers, his team did the right thing. But he had a closet with he, classified information His lawyers information did the right, found. Did again, 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 did he did, he was right surprised that the records were there. He spoke to this personally. He was surprised that the, that the records were there. 
And when his lawyers found out and his team found out that they were there, uh, they turned it over to the archives. And now it's being reviewed by the Department of Justice. And just one so now, as you all know, there's a special counsel dealing with this guy. Thank you, Corrine. Another one on GarageGate. What is the White House trying to hide? Nothing. Someone gave the president a statement to read on Tuesday that was incomplete at best, misleading at worst. Who? So I have read out the president's statement. I have read it out yesterday and what he said. He said that he, will, he respects or he takes classified information and documents very seriously. That's what he said. He said that he did not know that the, the records were there. He does not know what's in them. He said that. You heard from him directly on this. And his team has been cooperating fully, fully. And not only that, again, I'll say this, the Attorney General said this himself, that he heard from the team shortly after. So we have laid out, laid out uh, what has occurred here. You've heard from the White House counsel. Uh, I just read the statement uh, from, uh, from his lawyer. And again, uh, you know, we take this very seriously, and the President does as well. When will the White House release a log of visitors to the Wilmington House? You know, um, Peter, you've asked this question, or as your colleagues have asked this question before, let's not forget uh, what we did here in this White House. We instituted something that the last administration got rid of, which is putting out the White House, uh, putting, uh, making sure that there was a White House log, extensive White House log, so the American I mean, people the got to see, house where again, there is potentially again, unsecured well, classified I, material. Again, I am telling you, we did something that the last administration got rid of, which is instituting the White House logs. Uh, did you ask the last administration why they got rid of the White House logs? Okay, let's go. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Well, the Fox did. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, since so many of our questions have been referred to the DOJ and to the White House Counsel's Office, I'm sure you can understand that we're in sort of information <laughs> blackout where DOJ refers us to the special counsel. They're not holding any briefings. White House Counsel refers us to DOJ. So. If you are not able to talk about this from the podium, would you invite a DOJ official to take our questions here uh, to the briefing? No, you would have to go to the Department of Justice. That is not, it, this is a, a legal matter that is currently happening at the Department of Justice. And the President has been very, very clear when it comes to these types of legal matters, when it comes to investigations, he's not going to interfere. Uh, he wants to make sure that we give back the independence that the Department of Justice should have when it comes to these types of uh, investigations. So certainly would not be bringing them here. Uh, so I would refer you to the Department of Justice. I, I just, I, I was just very clear. If you have any questions, I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. They did a call for 45 minutes yesterday, speaking to many of you. I believe there were more than 200 people on that call. And so I would refer you to my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office. But on questions that you should be able to answer here that shouldn't have to go to any other agency or entity, can you tell us if there's any sort of assessment that has been planned or launched to determine if national security has been jeopardized at all? Again, that's for the Department of Why Justice. Why is to. it a DOJ and, and, it's, and let's be clear, it's not your decision to make on what I can or can't answer from here. What I'm telling you is that we are respecting the process. We are being prudent from here. There is an investigation currently happening. And when there is, when there are investigations that are happening, that the DOJ is, is uh, currently reviewing or looking at, we have been very consistent to say that you need to go to the Department of Justice. Are you with NSC or with any other intelligence Again, agency? Again, I would I refer you. I would. It's very. It's it's very clear. Is I I just laid out. There is no. There should be no confusion here. There there is a legal process happening, and I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Okay. okay. Go ahead. From this president. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Corrine. When you found out that the FBI had located even more classified materials in Wilmington. Which four-letter word did you use? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness, Peter. Um, Can't say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, President Biden is still intending to run for re-election in 2024, right? Uh, 
I'll just repeat what the president said after the midterm election, which is he intends to run. I'm going to be very careful from here, as you know, uh, because we are covered by the Hatch Act, and I'm not going to speak further to his process. Is there a precedent for people running for president after FBI agents search their sock drawer? Say that one more time. Say that beginning is, part. Is there a precedent for people running for president after FBI it sounds like agents? You, it sounds like you already know that that the answer to that question. Look, here's what I, I don't here's, know the answer to no, that question. Here's, here's, An here's, FBI here's, search of a president's residence is a big, big deal. Here's what the president's going to focus on. He's going to focus on continuing to deliver for the American people. That's his focus. That's what he focuses on every day. That's what he's been focusing on the last two years. And nothing is going to change that. You think about the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. You think about the Inflation Reduction Act. You think about the Chips and Science Act. Bipart those, the bipartisan one, the last two that I mentioned, done in a bipartisan way, that's what the president wants to do. He wants to continue to deliver on his economic plan that is going to build the economy from the bottom up, middle out. And that is what matters to the president. The House Oversight Committee chairman says this document situation has all the makings of a potential cover-up. Is President Biden involved in a cover-up? We have been very clear here from this administration. The president has been very clear that um, he takes this very seriously when it comes to the when it comes to classified information, when it comes to classified documents, and that his team has been um, has been fully cooperative uh, with this legal matter. Anything else, Peter? And this is, and I'm, I'm going to be very serious. You asked me kind of a question that everybody laughed at, which was interesting question to ask. But any other, uh, any other underlying questions that you may have, I would refer you to my colleagues, the White House Counsel. I'm going to continue to be prudent. I'm going to be continue to be consistent and refer you uh, to any questions you have there. Thanks, Green. After a special counsel was named, but before the FBI searched, President Biden went to his house in Wilmington. What was he doing in there? I would refer you to the White House Counsel. So office. it was something relating to this case? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's office. Okay. Do you think that this story was leaked by someone trying to bruise the president politically ahead of a re-election announcement? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's office as they've been the ones who've been uh, uh, closely involved. Okay. More basically, we know the president did it. Why did he do it? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. In the president's own words, he admits to having information that wasn't his. Why did he smuggle it out? I will let the, 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 the statement of the president stand for itself. I'm just not going to go into a rabbit hole, down a rabbit hole with you on this. Why did he not and, tell you about uh, it? Kareem, yes, thanks. Uh, slight shift to topic. Back. Um, so, when you talk about infrastructure, you say it's important for the president to have a chance to speak directly to the American people. Why doesn't he want to speak directly to the American people now that some big cities are bracing potentially this weekend for riots? So, he put out a statement yesterday, um, and I think when a statement comes from the president of the United States, it has a powerful impact. Uh, and he was very clear in that statement. He offered his condolences to the family of Ty Tyree Nichols. He also joined the family in calling for peaceful protests. That is an important uh, statement that the president could make. Uh, and uh, you have me here reiterating what the president has said. And we're going to continue to do that. It's not the first time I've laid out the Dobbs decision uh, was, a, was a time where we were calling uh, for peaceful protest. And there's been other times uh, even before then. So, and, and let's not forget Election Day, uh, where we did the same. So I think the president's words really matter. They have weight. And it's important that we, the, the American people heard from him uh, directly. OK, on the documents, have any more classified documents been located in any places associated with President Biden? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. OK, and why do White House officials insist that the president self-reported the classified materials if his lawyers initially called the White House and not the Justice Department? I would refer you to the White House Counsel. But we heard from this podium the other day that President Biden uh, self-reported the materials. That's not what, exactly what happened. Um, who did you hear that from? John Kirby. Well, I would refer you to the White House counsel. Go ahead. Um, just one more on the, the lab leak news from the Department of Energy. 
with all of this information coming out, and obviously the president had ordered a multi-agency effort um, that included the Department of Energy to try to you know get at the origins question. But looking, you know, with hindsight 2020, and now these conclusions coming out from parts of this administration, was it prudent to have at the time some administration officials voicing support for one origins theory over another, like Dr. Fauci did at a couple in a couple instances. He said, you know, my belief is that it's most likely uh, natural transmission. Um, Dr. Collins at one point sent an email to Dr. Fauci that was discussing um, the lab leak theory as a, a conspiracy theory. So given where we're at now, looking backward and with respect to how we talk about these things, if it ever happens in the future, is it is it prudent to have members within the administration voicing support for one theory over another if there isn't a consensus of that? So I, I do want to speak to Dr. Fauci because uh, the political attacks on someone like Dr. Fauci who uh, and, and public officials more broadly, but Dr. Fauci, who has spent his career saving lives, uh, and, um, and you know whether it was the AIDS epidemic or as we are just uh, coming out of this uh, 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 COVID, this once in a generation pandemic, uh, these attacks have been counterproductive. They have not been helpful. Uh, this is someone again who has spent his almost entire career uh, fighting for the well-being, the health of the American people, and so I just want to call out the political attacks. I think, again, it's not been helpful. Dr. Fauci himself has said he agrees with the president uh, that we needed to get to the bottom of this, to get to the bottom of where COVID originated. And that's what the president did from almost the, the, certainly the first few months of his administration. And we have been grateful. Again, we have been grateful to Dr. Fauci's wisdom. We've been grateful to Dr. Fauci's advice during the COVID response. And uh, we have been very, very clear here. We need, we need, we need to know more. Uh, we need to get to the bottom of how uh, how uh, how uh, COVID-19 originated, and so that is why. Again, that is why the president ad directed his uh, his IC and his intelligence com 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 community uh, to get to the bottom of this. And so I'll leave it there. More broadly than Dr. Fauci, though, I guess what I'm getting at is there was not so long ago a point where anyone asking the question of whether a lab leak was a credible theory that should be looked into. You know, a lot of those people were derided as, as fringe, you know, conspiracy theorists. So are there lessons learned, you know, looking back about how we discuss um, theories when we don't have all of the answers? So what, here's what I can tell you is the president's commitment to getting to the bottom of this, right? That is what's the most important so that we can you know, we can share this with Congress, we can share this with the American people. That is why he asked the IC uh, to do its work. And right now, there is no consensus. There is no consensus. You heard this from Jake Sullivan yesterday. You heard this from my colleague just moments ago. And we are going to do everything that we can. The president is asking his team to do everything that they can uh, to figure out where it originated because of what could potentially happen next, because of the potential of having another pandemic. And I think that's what's why is President Biden afraid of China? The president is not afraid of China. Well, did you see? Did you see the president last week when we went to uh, when we went to uh, we went to Ukraine, went to Kiev? This is not a president that's afraid of anything. It was a historic trip uh, that many of you said was brave. Uh, so clearly, this is a president that's not afraid to go to a war zone. Uh, he's not afraid to go there when there's no military presence on the ground. So there's nothing that this president fears. China flew a spy craft over the US. The president didn't really do anything to China. And according to the FBI director, China may have created something that has killed more than 1.1 million people in this country. And President Biden is not punishing them. So you're, you're giving me two, two things here. So let's take them in parts. Um, as we talk about the Chinese surveillance, the China surveillance balloon, the president did take that down, and he did it uh, in a way that, as it was on its path, we collected information from it, we protected our national security uh, information on the ground, and we did it in a way that was smart, effective, uh, and also protected the American people. That's what the president's always going to put forth, is the, is the safety of the American people. So that's what the president did with that particular uh, issue. Look, as it relates to, uh, you're talking about the COVID origins, uh, we've been very clear. We've been very clear that we need the data. 
uh, and uh, we need to figure out how to get to the bottom of, uh, of the COVID origins. And that's something that the president has said uh, since the beginning of this administration. But so that none of that has changed. But with this campaign, it was all about shutting down the virus and how hard it is for families with an empty chair at the kitchen table because of COVID. If we now know, according to the FBI director, who is most likely responsible for all those empty chairs at all those kitchen tables, why not do more to try to hold them so, accountable? So I'm going to flip that on its head for a second. It was because of this president that took action. By the way, the last administration did not. They did not have a comprehensive plan to but actually. No, 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 no. No. To COVID, no. Where did COVID no, but, come but, from? But, if we know. Peter, you can't tell. First of all, you can't tell me how to answer the question. I'm going to answer to it for you, right? So just give me a second. So because he took those actions, he actually helped to save lives. Because he he took action to make sure that people got shots in arms and put a comprehensive plan in front of the American people and put in the work. Uh, we actually were able to get to a place where COVID is not gone, but we now are in a place where we're in a different place in the pandemic, and that's because of the president. And that's because of his leadership. So let's not let's like be very real about the, what the president has done over the last two years to take on COVID, to make sure that the economy is growing again, uh, to make sure that we're really working for the American people. So that's number one. I want to be very very clear on that. Now to your question about COVID origins, as we've known, as we know, we have seen many. Uh, uh, many different uh, uh, conclusions right from uh, from from the intelligence community uh, some of them have made some conclusion on one side some of them have made conclusions on the other side some of them say they don't have enough information so want to be also very careful uh, there as well and it was because of this president very early on the first several months of his administration he went to the intelligence community and said we need to figure out how to get to the bottom of this we need to figure out uh, how this all occurred because who knows? We have to try and prevent any future pandemic. So that is the work that this president did. And it included clearly the uh, Department of Energy that has national labs. And so now they're continuing to double down and try to get to the bottom of this. Our relationship with China has not changed. It is, it is very different, very clear, very different than how we've seen it in the last administration. All right, I'm going to continue. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. I have a question about the Willow Project in Alaska. What's more important to President Biden, improving energy security or reducing fossil fuels? So, first of all, um, it doesn't have to be uh, one or the other. Right? Well, we can try to be doing In both. 2019, I guarantee you we are going to end fossil fuel. So this project would just be dead, right? So here's what I can say about that. The president uh, did meet with the Alaska delegation uh, last week at the White House. Uh, he always appreciates uh, uh, me speaking and meeting with the full delegation to understand what their concerns are. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and when it comes to that specific decision, that's something that the Sec Secretary of Interior is going to make. Uh, so I'm not going to get ahead of, uh, of where she's going to be. But the President has met with the delegation. And I'm just going to leave it there. Okay. And another subject. How worried should Americans be about China spying on them here at home? And what do you mean specifically, Peter? Well, there were the Chinese spy balloons, and now there are these Chinese spy cranes. The Wall Street Journal is comparing them to Trojan horses in use at 80% of U.S. ports. So let me first say that what the American people could be assured of is that this president is going to protect them. Uh, and making sure that we put our national security uh, first when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to uh, anything that they feel uh, could be uh, could threaten that, and so and the president has shown that he's shown that over and over again. So on on the cranes, don't have to uh, don't have any comment on that specific reporting. I would refer you to the Department of Transportation uh, and the Department of Defense, who've been uh, tasked with Congress to study uh, this particular issue. The National Security Council, in close coordination with the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Defense, Coast Guard, and members of the Intelligence Committee, have been actively working to address potential cyber vulnerabilities across the marine transportation system. This includes enhanced coordination across the federal government and engagement uh, with key stakeholders in the maritime industry. And just last month, the administration issued a worldwide maritime port vulnerabilities advisory underscoring the potential threats posed by foreign manufacturer port equipment. So uh, again, this is something that the president takes very seriously and uh, will always take action to make sure we protect our national security. And if this is a Department of Transportation lead, does Secretary Buttigieg have experience it's a, with it's, 
it's not just the, it's not just the Department of Transportation. It's also Department of Defense. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, has okay, Peter. Thanks, Green. So cartels kill Americans on this side of the border with drugs, and now they're killing Americans on the other side of the border with guns. Why is President Biden so comfortable? with cartels operating so close to the U.S.? Well, let's be very clear. Let me take on the drug part here, because since you brought this up, um, because of the work that this president has done, because of what we've done specifically on fentanyl at the border, it's at historic lows, historic levels, uh, that we have been able to uh, record a number of personnel working to secure the border because of what we've been able to do. Seizing that fentanyl, uh, we've done it in a historic way. That's because of what this president has done. I just talked about 23,000 federal agents that have been able to be, uh, uh, that we've been able to hire and put at the border to secure the border. On top of that, historic sanctions going after traffickers and other financiers are helping disrupt fentanyl supply chains throughout their flow to the U.S. And we're, we're really expanded access to treatments like uh, that are saving lives, if you think about it, which prevent overdoses expanding as, uh, as our fentanyl test trips. Uh, and through the removal of the X waiver, anyone registered to pres prescribe controlled medications can now uh, prescribe life-saving medication to treat addiction. So again, we are seizing fentanyl at record historic levels because of what the because of the of what the president has done to secure our border. Uh, and look, we've also coordinated, uh, made sure that we're coordinated our our. our um, uh, our relationship with, Mex with Mexico uh, to deal with um, what we're seeing as it relates to violence, as it relates to cartel. Uh, that is something, a relationship that we've continued to build with Mexico, an incredibly important partner. Uh, you saw that when he went down for the summit in Mexico City. So the president is, is, is dedicated to this and is doing the work that we're actually seeing at the border, again, when you th we think about fentanyl. But to the violence aspect of it, now Americans are being slaughtered. Would President Biden be taking the same approach if it was al-Qaeda or ISIS operating just across the border from an American city? The president takes this very seriously. He takes this very seriously. The FBI and other agencies have been on top of this uh, from day one. And so that's what he's going to continue to do. Uh, when it comes to Americans' lives and when it comes to their, the safety of Americans, the president's always going to make sure that that is a top priority. Would President Biden ever consider using the U.S. military? to disrupt cartel operations. I'm, I'm just not going to get into uh, the military and how it's being used. Okay. I want to go back. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. On artificial intelligence, 1,000 of the world's smartest people are saying that AI <coughs> pose profound risks to society and humanity. They want you guys to regulate it. Will you? You're talking about the letter that was released yesterday. So, uh, look, it highlights a number, uh, a number of challenges addressed directly uh, in, uh, in the administration's blueprint for an AI uh, Bill of Rights, which was released last October, as I'm sure you've been following, Peter. It includes <laughs> principles and practices AI creators can use to ensure uh, protections related to safety, civil rights, civil liberties, or are integrated into AI systems from start to finish. Uh, right now, there's a comprehensive process that is underway to ensure a cohesive federal government approach to AI-related risk and opportunities, including how to ensure that AI <laughs> innovation and deployment uh, proceeds with appropriate pr prudence and safety foremost in mind. And so we're going to, be, I don't have anything to announce at this point, at this time, but there is a comprehensive process in place. So announcements aside, there is now a, uh, <coughs> there's an expert from the Machine Intelligence Research Institute who says that if there is not an indefinite pause on AI development, this is a quote, literally everyone on earth will die. <laughs> Would you agree that does not sound good? <laughs> uh, I mean, Your delivery, Peter, is quite, <laughs> it's quite something. It sounds crazy, but is it? Uh, all I can say is that there's a comprehensive process in place. We put out a blueprint back in October, as you know. I don't have anything to share. Uh, we have seen the letter. We understand what their concerns are. Uh, again, a comprehensive process. We're going to let that, we'll let that flow. So is President Biden worried? that artificial intelligence could become self-aware? Look, we are, again, there's a comprehensive process. Uh, we are taking this very seriously. We put our blueprint out. 
uh, back in October. I just don't want to get ahead of our findings and what that uh, what that's going to look like. Uh, but it is a cohesive federal government approach to AI rela related risks, as you just laid out in a very dramatic way. Uh, but clearly, is there <laughs> anything more dramatic? I mean, you just read it. Literally, everyone on Earth will die. Pretty, pretty <laughs> dramatic. Pretty dramatic. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on. But thank you, Peter. Thank you for the drama. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Karine. Uh, not asking about Trump, but about the precedent that this opens. Does the White House believe that a former president could or should be indicted? I'm just not going to comment from here. Okay. All right. Oh, go ahead, Peter. To follow up on that, President Biden is a lawyer. Is he and, and the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief, but go ahead. He is, but uh, as a lawyer, is he concerned at all that a local DA indicting a former president could, down the line, open up the possibility, set the precedent, that local DAs that don't like former President Biden could indict him? I'm not going to comment from here. Why don't you have more to say about the Trump indictment? It is an ongoing um, case. And I've been very clear about that. We've been prudent about that, not commenting on ongoing cases. Well, and we're going to stick to that. But for Peter? better or worse, all that anybody in the country is talking about at this exact moment while we we're in here is Trump. And they look here to find out what the White House thinks about it. And well, I think the American people should feel reassured that when there is an ongoing case like this one, that we're just not commenting. And so, does the lack of comment mean that you do not think anything happening in New York today is one of the top issues facing the country at the moment? That's your assessment. Uh, that's not my assessment. I am just laying out the facts that we are just not going to comment on an ongoing uh, case from here. And we've been very consistent. We've been very prudent. And we're going to stick there. Peter. You got this Ireland trip next week. <laughs> how does the dramatics. Biden, how does a Biden trip to Ireland help counter China or end the war in Ukraine? So let me just say a couple of things. The president is certainly looking forward uh, to taking this trip to Northern Ireland and also the UK. Uh, we're, he'll be heading out on Tuesday. We certainly will have more to share on, on this trip uh, uh, coming uh, in the upcoming days, as my colleague just said on Monday. But I, I also want to lay out here the important, uh, kind of the important history between U.S. and Ireland. Right? When you think about uh, the waves of Irish immigrants who help, uh, who help shape America's spirit of freedom, that's incredibly important uh, as well. And I think telling that story, the president going there and being able to uh, touch on his own his own family story the f and the stories of many of Americans here Irish Americans here uh, as you think about how this country was created and, and built and put together uh, by immigrants I think that's important I think that's something that's important to highlight and the person's lo the president looking forward to that uh, thank you Corrine first on the news of the day does it bug President Biden when former presidents suck up all the oxygen What's important to the president is to continue to focus on the American people. That is what's important to the so, president. So he's good to lay low for a couple news cycles. Then. So look, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Peter. And this is what we will speak to. We will speak to the fact that, that this is a president that has been able to uh, get historic pieces of legislation done. When you think about uh, the infrastructure legislation, something that you know we heard Many, many times during the last administration, Infrastructure Week, Infrastructure Week, guess what this president was able to do? He was able to bring both, par both sides together to get this done. And now we have, uh, we're seeing investments in the country, a rebuilding in the country that we haven't seen in 70 years. That's what the president cares about. He cares about the fact that Medicare is now able uh, to, uh, to, to uh, work, you know, talk to big pharma to lower, uh, and to negotiate and lower costs. That's what the president t cares about. What he wants to see is how do we build on his economic policies, the economic plan uh, that, we, that has been able to turn this country around from when he first walked in uh, from, uh, 
from you know what we saw happen in the last administration basically a mess when it came to the economy when it came to dealing with covid so what the president wants to do is to build on that and that's his focus he wakes up every morning thinking about the american people he goes to bed every night thinking about the american people okay on the taiwan president visit if china tries to take over taiwan is president biden still committed to putting U.S. boots on the ground in Taiwan. We've we've answered this question multiple times. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't have anything else to share. Okay. And then on the China spy craft, why did President Biden say about the China spy craft in February? We were able to protect sensitive sites against collection. If that's not true. I'm not going to go into a dive into any reporting. Uh, that, that's not something I'm going to do. I'm not going to confirm any reporting. Look, we knew not, the flight. Not reporting. The DNI said today that the U.S. does not appear to have provided critical new insights to the People's Republic of China. So is it they didn't provide any new critical insights or they didn't get anything? I would refer you to the ODNI if you have specific questions on their reporting. What I can tell you from here and what we have said many times is that we knew the flight path of the balloon before it crossed the United States. We took precautions in advance to ensure that it didn't get sensitive information. And when it, when it, when it comes to technology like this balloon, it has limited additive value compared to other means of intelligent collection. And we have said that. And the, and the bottom line is this is the, the administration that identified the problem and took action. The Federal Reserve economists are now predicting a recession starting this year. Is President Biden going to do anything differently to try to head that off? Well, as you know, and you've heard me talk about this, our economy, because of what the president has put forth, uh, his economic policy that makes sure that we don't do trickle-down economics, that we do, uh, we have an economy, economic uh, economy, pardon me, that grows for everyone from the bottom up, middle out, that does not leave anyone behind. And we're seeing the success of that, uh, of, of his plans. Uh, and recent economic indicators are not consistent with a recession or even a pre-recession. And you can just look at the data. 12.5 million jobs have been created since he took office. 12.5 million jobs. Uh, we've gained all the jobs lost during the pandemic and created 3 million more jobs. And so unemployment is a near 50-year low, and black unemployment is, as, is at a record low. Annual inflation has fallen over the last nine months. Wages are higher than they were nine months ago. Incomes are up, and, and consumer spending is strong. Those are the indicators that show us that we are not headed to a recession or a pre-recession. That is because of the work that this president has done over the last two years. About the leaks, how bad is it? Well, as I mentioned, there is a DOJ uh, review right now, so I'm not going to get ahead of that review. Uh, again, when DOD learned about this, they quickly asked the Department of Justice to step in and to review and to look into the process. Just not going to get ahead of it. But we've also have said that, of course, we are concerned about the potential uh, national national security risk. We've been very clear about that from the White House, from the Department of Defense. Uh, but again, there's a review going on, so I just don't want to get ahead of that. But, so this Afghanistan report last week found that the intel was bad there, and now some more reliable intel is leaking out. Is President Biden satisfied with the people who are handling American intelligence? So what I'll say is, again, DOJ is reviewing these documents. Uh, we cannot speak to the validity of these documents. Uh, so want to be careful that we don't get ahead, because the way that you're asking me the question is asking uh, uh, about the kind of goes into the specifics of the documents, which I cannot do from here. Uh, the DOD is certainly uh, uh, has, they've announced that they're taking steps to further restrict access to these sensitive information, and we're going to let DOJ do move forward with their process. And you said that social media companies have a responsibility to prevent this kind of stuff from circulating. Would President Biden meet with Elon Musk? talk about social media company responsibilities i don't have a i don't have any uh, meetings to read out to you obviously this is something that the intelligence community is going to uh is is you know they're the ones who are, are can speak to this more but i'm just not going to speak to that as it relates to classified information and the last one just on that shouted question that he did respond to on, on the debt ceiling um having heard your response to the questions that were answered already here today um You've had now Democrats saying that Republicans have you know, come to the table, might not like what they came to the table with. 
but it's time for the dialogue. You know, how long can this posture from the president last before it, it feels like intellectually dishonest to say, you know, they're holding the economy hostage and not raising the debt ceiling when they did pass a bill to raise the debt ceiling and the, the argument's really about the, the budget cuts, the spending cuts, and not about whether or not the debt ceiling gets raised. It's, so I have to say, Jackie, I disagree with the intellectually dishonest. That is certainly not how we see ourselves here because we've been very, very clear that they need to deal with the debt ceiling. They need to not default. It is a constitutional duty. And it's, again, this is not to us. This is to the American people. They if you think, without no, conditions, but, no, like uh, unless it's a clean uh, bill, they won't. I mean, I've been very clear. Without conditions, we we will not negotiate. There's not. There's nothing new there. What you're seeing that the House Republicans have done is they are. In, they said that unless the president, and I've said this before, this is nothing new that I'm about to say. Uh, unless the president and the Senate agree to an extreme MAGA wish list, slashing, slashing education, veterans health care, Meals on Wheels taking away health care from millions of Americans and sending manufacturing jobs overseas, they're going to default and crash the economy. We've said this over and over and over again and been very clear. The president does not agree with this bill. He think, he believes and we believe and the American people deserve this, that they need to do their constitutional duty. They need to do this uh, so that we are not holding, they are not holding, not we, they are not holding the, the economy, our American economy hostage. We cannot be de a deadbeat nation. We cannot be. It's a clean debt I, I, Look, I, we've been very clear about this. We've been very, very clear. I appreciate, I appreciate the, mer the question. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just take a question from the back. Uh, well, I, I just took a bunch of questions on this. You I want. You literally just told me you would come back. Uh, to yeah, you also you also. But you literally, just told me, you literally just told me. I you said wait back. your turn, but now we're running out of time. Go ahead. You said yesterday that when it comes to illegal migration, you've seen it come down by more than ninety percent. Where did that number come from? It because was, I was CBP speaking. is telling us the number is. I hear you. I'm about to answer. I'm about, people more I'm about to answer this you. Year so if far. you, if you, if the dramatics could come down just a little bit. I, um, know, if it, the dramatics could come down a little what's bit. What's dramatic about asking a question about? Okay, I'm I'm going to answer. So I was speaking to the parolee program. As you know, the president put in place a parolee program to deal with uh, to deal with certain countries uh, on on ways that we can limit illegal migration. And we have seen the data has shown us that it has gone down by more than ninety percent. That was what I was speaking and to. to no, I'm, really we're, we're going to go. We're going to move. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're moving, Peter. Let's go. Um, Forty-three Republican senators signed on to a letter opposing raising the debt ceiling without budget reforms, and 217 members in the House voted for that bill to raise the debt limit with cuts to spending. Does the White House consider all of those members to be dangerous MAGA Republican extremists? Do they understand what the cuts that they're voting for is going to do? Do they? Do th that's the question. I mean, Republicans in Congress, in the House specifically, voted for cuts that's going to hurt American families. I mean, we can't say this enough. 22% cuts to veterans, health care, schools. That's what they voted for. That's what, and, and this is not, okay, but this is not, this is not just, this is their constituents. This is what they voted for. And, and those constituents, that they're voting on behalf of have said that they're concerned about their retirements, about the effects of inflation, and those members represent more than half of the country in the House. I mean, those that's the majority of, of districts in the country, that they're voting on behalf of those constituents who are expressing concern about where the economy is. So I guess, how can the White House continue to use messaging calling this the Default on America Act um, and, and paint this legislation in, in such a way without having a, a conversation about the budget um, when you've got half the country saying that they want that conversation. So House Republicans are threatening a first ever default. They want the president to agree on a plan in its entirety that includes cuts, that includes cuts to programs that are incredibly important for the American family because they want to hold the American economy hostage, because that's what they're saying that they want to do by threatening, uh, by threatening a default. Their bill would raise the debt limit. They passed a bill to raise the debt limit. 
So they're the conversation. They connect. And I hear you, but they are connecting, passing whatever this debt limit to cuts, 22 percent cuts to veterans, to seniors. That's what they are threatening. Cuts to our schools. That's what the twenty. That's what is connecting. That's what their budget plan is. The bill doesn't have any appropriations in it, actually, and, and the, the speaker has. You know, ruled out a number of those things, including defense, veterans benefits, senior entitlement programs. I mean, you have Mitt Romney saying that there has to be a conversation here. Is he a MAGA Republican extremist? What I'm saying is House Republicans have been very clear. They voted on a bill that's going to cut programs that are very important to American families. Law enforcement, cutting programs to law enforcement, cutting program to veterans, veteran care cutting program to our school system. That's what Republicans have voted on. So those are extreme. Those are very extreme. These are things that the American people don't want. Just look at 20, 2022, what they voted for. They voted for to protect, to protect their retirement accounts. That's what the American people want to see. And so they're connecting those two. They want the president to agree on its entire agenda of an extreme budget. It is an extreme budget something that Americans do not want. And, it, you know, that's something for them to answer to. This is, this is also speaking to their, they're speaking to their constituents when they're voting for something like that. And so look, the president put forth a budget where it also cuts spending, but not hurting American families. We're trying to make sure that we lower the deficit by saying that we're gonna cut the deficit by $3 trillion over 10 years. But he put forth something that is actually responsible Remember, show me your value. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. That's what the president said. They showed their value by showing veteran, cutting veterans program, cutting school programs, cutting health care, 22%. That's what they value. That's something that they have to, to answer to the American people about. Go ahead, Ed. About the debt limit, there's no negotiating around the debt limit. They should do their constitutional duty and move forward. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Crane. Um, the White House keeps saying that Republicans are manufacturing a crisis by refusing to do a clean bill to raise the debt limit. Right now, the nation's debt exceeds 100% of its GDP. This has happened twice in U.S. history, once during World War II and once now, over the last couple of years. How is it not a crisis when the country literally owes more than it's worth? You should ask the, you should ask the Speaker this question. This is his job. This is his constitutional duty to move forward and get the debt limit done. That is a question for him. They are the legislative, it is a co-equal branch, as you know, they are the legislative body, and this is what they're supposed to do. That is a question, seriously, that is a question for the Speaker and the MAGA Republicans who are literally holding our economy hostage. I, I have to move on. So I'm, I promise to take one more. The debt is a crisis. I'll take, I'll you take one more. The debt is a crisis. Thank you, Green. So. And you just said that you're assuming the President will be updated momentarily by the team. What was he doing for the last several hours while they were in these meetings? Well, the, they were having conversations, right? They were on the Hill, uh, right, the negotiators. But how, how, how would he, he yeah, but how would he be updated if they're still having conversations on the Hill? It just ended moments ago. Couldn't he call uh, Look, look, Peter. He just look, wait, uh, look, Peter. The first year of his term, he conducted, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, by video conference. Is that not possible right now? Look, Peter. We're going to give the space to these negotiators, the time and the space, to have these conversations. That's what we're going to do. The president is going to continue to be updated regularly, daily, as he has been for the past uh, couple of days. And that's how we're moving forward. That's how we're, we're seeing uh, this process. The president has sat down twice with congressional leaders very recently to hear them out, to have the conversation, to talk about his budget, to talk about the urgency of getting, uh, of getting the debt limit done, of Congress doing their job. And so he continues to, he continued to hold the line in that, very, in that way. And so, look, we're going to have the negotiators have their conversation. They just ended uh, their uh, last convening, if you will, and they're going to reconvene, I'm certain of that. And so the president's going to get an update from his team, as he did last night, as he'd done the last couple of days. I'm just going to keep going. Go ahead. Thanks, So the last time that we got this close to a debt ceiling default, President Obama deputized his vice president to lead the negotiations. Why doesn't President Biden trust Vice President Harris to lead these negotiations well, while he's in Asia? 
Well, I disagree with your, uh, the premise of your question. Uh, the president does, does, well, well, let me. The president entrusts the vice president, as we all know, as we have stated many times, she, she was in the meeting that with the congressional members that occurred very recently, right before the president left uh, for Japan. She has been in regular conversations as well and has been in, in conversations with the president. He has taken her uh, consult and listened to her advice, as he always does on many issues. This is one of many issues. And so that has not changed. And I think you actually said something that is incredibly important. The president has been there before, right? He has dealt with these types of negotiations, these types of conversations before. He knows how this all works. Uh, this is not new to him. And this is why he is optimistic. And this is why these conversations are going to continue and he's going to stay on top of them. Yeah. Thank okay. you, I'll come to the back after. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the tone in the last few days has been very respectful between the White House and McCarthy's team. You just said a few moments ago that <coughs> McCarthy's team is working in good faith. But this morning you had House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries slamming MAGA Republicans for dangerous default gamesmanship. Uh, you had Pete Aguilar saying McCarthy's beholden to the most extreme members of his party. So is House Democratic leadership undermining the work of the administration right now? Not at all. We are, uh, we are in line, aligned with them, uh, with, the, with the leadership on both the House and the Senate. And, uh, and that continues, and we have been aligned with them for the past several months. Does Jeffries speak for the party here? Uh, I believe he's the leader of the, of the uh, Democratic caucus on the House, so I would presume that is a yes. So it, it just seems like there's a, a bit of a divide between the rhetoric that he's using and the rhetoric we're hearing out of the White House. Look, I think multiple things could happen at the same time. Clearly, uh, 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 Leader uh, Jeffries is a is a partner in this, has been a partner as long as well as uh, Leader Schumer. That will continue, uh, and uh, and I'll just leave it there. I'm going to go to back. Uh, the discharge position. One more. Is that at all a signal that? House Democrats doubt the president's ability to lead the country to a solution here. Well, that's an extreme um, analysis or or uh, uh, final kind of uh, uh, analysis. There, I I would say. Uh, if you look at what the president has done the last two years and the leadership that he has shown in passing historic pieces of legislation, bringing uh, uh, the Democrats uh, together in passing uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, when he brought the, the Democrats together to pass his first legislation, which is the American Rescue Plan that helped get the economy back on its feet, that is a president that has led. That is a president that has continued to lead. You look at the economy, the economy has been able to uh, create 12.7 million jobs. It's been able to see an unemployment rate at one of the lowest that we have seen uh, in modern time. And that's going to continue if we are continue to do the work of the American people, get this budget negotiation uh, done. And uh, and here, that's at stake. The work that this president has done, that is what's at stake right now. I just think would be like an end run around what the president is doing. Well, absolutely not. Look, I would, I would um, refer you to Congress on their processes and what they're trying to do in Congress. But to say, to say or suggest the president's leadership is in question, I think is completely false. I disagree with that with that premise and certainly with that question because if you look at the last two years, if you look at what Democrats have been able to, to get done with the leadership of this president, that is the complete opposite of what you just laid out. Go ahead, April. Good morning, I haven't seen you since Japan. Nice to see you again. I'm sure. <laughs> You can say it's nice to see me. Uh, it's nice to see you too, Peter. Uh, it's been more than a month since the re-election announcement. Is President Biden going to hold a campaign event ever? So I will say this to you, Peter. As you know, uh, we follow the rule of law here. We believe in following the rule of law as it relates. Hold on. As Not it relates. You to weigh in on the I, of election, I'm about just his schedule. I'm, You'll have to I'm, schedule around I'm, rallies. I'm I'm about to answer your question here. Uh, as it relates to anything that uh, uh, that is connected to the campaign, any rallies, any events, uh, any any endorsement, anything that is connected to the 2024 re-election, that is not going to certainly come from here. That is going to come from his campaign or the DNC and so, or the DNC. So you can't say if he will be campaigning for re-election. I, I I'm just not going to comment from okay. here. And then on, another on 2024 re-election. Another story. The Hatch Act does exist. A group of experts now say that AI poses an extinction risk right up there with nuclear war and a pandemic. Does President Biden agree? What I can say, you're speaking to the letter that was uh, provided today, made public. 
Um, and so, look, uh, the president and the vice president has been very clear on this as it relates to AI. It is one of the most powerful technologies, right, that we see currently uh, in our time. Uh, but our, uh, but uh, in order to seize the opportunities it presents, uh, we must mitig first mitis mitigate its risk. And that's what we're focusing on here in this administration. As you know, the AI, uh, we brought um, some CEOs here recently that the president and the vice president hosted uh, to the White House to reiterate their responsibility uh, for these specific companies have to ensure that products are safe uh, before they are released to the public. Uh, and so I will leave it there. Uh, I, as again, I know there's a letter that went out today from, uh, from Elon Musk and CEOs. I will let the public read that letter. But again, we have been very clear on that, how uh, companies need to be responsible uh, in, uh, as it relates to AI. All right. It's been months. Great. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. What is President Biden's top domestic priority? Well, we've always we've always been very clear that his economic clearly his economic policy is not something that's uh, uh, important, especially when he walked into this administration. The economy was on its head uh, because of the COVID response that was uh, um, uh, that was not ex that was in not existing and not is uh, with the last administration. And what the president had to do right to make sure that we were dealing with COVID, to make sure that we were dealing with the economy. And so he put forth along with Democrats and also in a bipartisan way some some historic pieces of legislation that turned the economy around. When you think about 12.7 million jobs created, when you think about unemployment at the lowest that we've seen in 54 years, that, that has been a top priority for the president. And it continues to be. And lowering prices as it relates to the economy certainly is something that the president takes very seriously and continues to work on with his team. And so today's talking about climate. There's a lot of action with China, and you mentioned high prices. So what is the what is the top priority overall? This, he is the president of the United States. There are multiple issues, multiple topics that the president has to deal with. That is the job of the president, right? He talked about climate. It was not just about climate. It was about how we foresee uh, the season coming up with hurricanes, the fires that we've seen uh, uh, across the country, how we're dealing with that uh, in, in this country in a serious way, protecting lives, protecting communities, thanking, uh, thanking the first responders. That's important and Americans care about that across the country. We've talked about the bipartisan uh, the bipartisan pardon me budget negotiation which is incredibly important, right? Because we're talking about how to deal with the economy for the American people in a way that helps all and also make sure that we do not default. All of those things are important. All of those multiple issues are something that the president has to deal with on a daily basis. And one more, why hasn't TikTok been banned yet? Look, as you know, there's a CFIUS review. I'm going to just leave it there. That is, it's being reviewed by that uh, by that committee, and so uh, the president thinks it's an important issue to deal with. But I just don't have anything else to add beyond. Thanks, Green. Um, Nikki Haley also last night uh, refused to answer a question about whether she would sign a bill for a six-week abortion ban uh, if it came to her desk, saying that the administration has not yet uh, outlined their position on whether they would sign bills. Uh, allowing abortions at 37, 38, 39 weeks. Could you give us the sort of correct, correct um, position of the administration in terms of what kind, if any, uh, kinds of restrictions on abortion the administration supports? So I didn't watch this uh, this town hall, so can't really speak to exactly what she said. What I can speak to, what the president has said, uh, which is that uh, he will continue to call on Congress uh, to restore Roe v. Wade. And so if you know the particulars of Roe v. v. Wade, you see what the president stands. So I'll just leave it there for now. And one other one on Nikki Haley. She also said that a vote for uh, President Biden is a vote for Vice President Kamala Harris. What do you say to anyone who is questioning whether the president would survive a full four-year term? So let me just say this. Uh, it, I'm not going to comment on the 2024. She is a candidate, so I want to be very careful here. Uh, and uh, we do follow the Hatch Act, so I want to be really, really mindful here. Um, look, this is a president, if you look at his track record, if you, and I'm saying this more broadly, if you look at what he's been able to do, uh, he has been able to push forward and get done historic pieces of legislation. Uh, he has gotten more done than any other president. When you think about the infrastructure legislation, when you think about the last president, it was a joke. 
we were talking about infrastructure week. It was literally a joke. Now you hear this president talking about infra infrastructure decade. When you think about being for Medicare, being able uh, to negotiate and lower cost for Americans, that matters. That matters to the American people. When you think about actually creating jobs, good paying jobs, which is part of this president's economic policy, that matters to the American people. The president literally, literally just was able to get done a bipartisan uh, agreement on the budget, which many people didn't think he would be able to get done. And this president was able to get done. So look, this is a president that's been attacked during 2020 where people said, oh, no one's going to, he's not going to win. He's not able to get it done. There's no way he's going to be the next president. And he made it happen. In 2022, the same thing. There's going to be a red wave. It's not going to happen. Democrats are in trouble. And look what happened. And because of what the president was able to go and do and make sure that there was a message out there uh, that Americans can see on what he's been able to do and what Democrats were able to do, he really had one had one of the best uh, midterm outcome for a new Democratic president in 60 years, in 60 years. And so, look, um, I'll leave you with a quote here. Here's something uh, that I think uh, that was said a couple days ago. It's a, a Huffington Post headline. After calling Joe Biden senile, Republicans complain he outsmarted them. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Karine. Just want to clarify your answer on the half chat. So until the uh, White House Counsel's Office makes its opinion, we're, should we expect not to hear you use MAGA from the podium? I've been very clear. I don't have anything to add. You, well, you have said that you're waiting for them to make their opinion, so I, I just wanted I, to know in the I, interim. I have answered that question. Okay. On the exposure incident on the South mm -hmm. Lawn, uh, having received the statement that uh, the White House believes that was inappropriate, disrespectful, is there going to be a greater effort in the future to communicate a code of conduct for White House guests? Look, we've, as you mentioned, the statement uh, that we put out, you heard from us earlier today, uh, the, the behavior was simply unacceptable. Uh, we've been very clear about that. It was unfair to the hundreds of attendees who were there to celebrate their families. Uh, so, you know, we're going to continue to be clear on that. And uh, that type of behavior is, uh, as I said, unacceptable. It's not appropriate. It's disrespectful. And let's not, uh, it, it really does not reflect the event that we hosted uh, to celebrate the LGBTQ plus families. And again, hundreds of families who were here uh, to celebrate uh, their community and who were here in attendance. So um, look, individuals in the video uh, certainly will not be invited to future events. And uh, this is, has not occurred before, right? This is not, this was not a normal thing that has happened under this administration. Uh, but we've been very clear about how, uh, how we saw this particular uh, behavior. There's, there's been some criticism also of um, the White House, the flag placement, the pride flag violating the US flag code. Did anybody notice that or, or fail to notice that? Or was it a, a, an intentional statement? Can you just explain what happened? With that? So the administration was proud, again, uh, to display uh, the pride uh, flag. Uh, it was a historic event at the White House. Uh, it's centered around the love uh, around love and family, and I think that's important. And uh, so, you know, we're not going to, to let anyone distract us from that. What was the meaning of the day? What was a, a, the meaning of having families here and to celebrate a community? I'm certainly not going to get into protocols from here, or uh, I'll leave that to others. And so, uh, you know, we're proud of this historic event that we were able uh, to put together uh, here on the South Lawn for our families. And uh, so I'll leave it there. And one more. Um, one more on cocaine. How determined is the president to get to the bottom of who brought illegal drugs into the White House? Secret Service is getting to the bottom, of it, and that's what matters, and it's under their purview. But it was the question was how determined is the president? The president thinks it's very important to get to the bottom of this. That's why Secret Service, which is under their purview, is looking into this, and they're going to look into what happened this weekend. So the president thinks it is incredibly important to get will, to the bottom of this. Will the administration be appealing the injunction? I just said the DOJ is uh, is reviewing this injunction, and they're going to look at, they're going to evaluate their options. So th it's for their decision to make. And the, the, can you just respond to the judge's accusation that each topic suppressed by the administration was a conservative view? He had a pretty 
strong statement, the U.S. government seems to have assumed a role similar to an Orwellian Ministry of Truth. Can you respond to that? I'm just not going to respond uh, to the Attorney General, the judge. Uh, I'll let the Department of Justice do that. And then I know you can't talk about 2024. They're just, this is like the sixth question. I know, I'm sorry. I'll let you go after this. <laughs> I know you can't talk about 2024, but how will this ruling impact the administration's efforts to get its messaging out ahead of the election? I'm just not going to speak about 2024. We respect the rule of law. And I'll leave it there. Okay, guys, I'll see you. I've missed you. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Yeah. How's baby Kareem? Uh, <laughs> she, she's good. She. Uh, oh, baby KJP. Very nice to her dad. Oh, during your your uh, Just your like leave. KJP. <laughs> oh, that's good. I like that's good. Okay. Uh, I have another question that you probably uh, were not expecting. Okay. Does President Biden want to limit Americans to two beers a week? I, I, where is this coming from? It's maybe funny. I didn't. Maybe I didn't miss you so much. Where is this? Where is this coming from? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Dr. George Koob, who is the uh, director of the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, oh. says the U.S. may soon follow Canada and recommend just two beers a week. How do you guys think that's going to go? Let me tell you what I'm not going to get involved in. In, uh, in, that, in that question right there. I, I have no idea, I've not seen the data. Uh, I cannot speak to this. Uh, I will leave it to the experts and not weigh so in. So if the experts say two beers a week, I, that's okay I, with I, will, I, I will leave it to the experts. I'm just not gonna comment on that. Okay, something else. The Secret Service is paying $16,000 a month now to stage near Hunter Biden in Malibu. Who's paying for that? That's a question for the Secret Service. Okay, Hunter Biden is reportedly selling art to pay for his $15,800 a month rent in Malibu. How can you guarantee that people are not going to be buying this art to gain favor with the president? That is a question for Hunter Biden and his representatives. It's, it's a question I, I know, of, I hear, of I hear, at the White House. We know I hear that one of the art question. buyers got a job from the Biden administration. Can you guarantee that there is I no hear, quid pro quo? I hear your question. I'm not going to get involved in this. That is a question for Hunter Biden's representatives. So, but we know that uh, from a Hunter Biden associate now that he sold the appearance of access to then Vice President Biden. Are you confident that he has stopped doing that? That is a question for Hunter Biden. If somebody is selling the appearance of access is, to the White House, that, that is, is a question for the White House. No, that is that is your uh, your I don't know how you're perceiving that. Of, sworn I, testimony I, by I, Devin I, Archer. He said, "I am just not, Peter. I'm just not going to get into this. I'm just not." So, this testimony since the last time that I was in here, uh, Devin Archer talks about how he and Hunter Biden tried to profit off the Biden brand. What is the Biden brand? Not going to get into it from here. Uh, thank you, Kareem. How is it possible that an ISIS sympathizer is sneaking people into this country? So just so that uh, folks, I'm assuming you're speaking to the CNN uh, story, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just want to make sure that uh, uh, folks who are watching understand the question. So I just want to be really clear here. So the intelligence alerted us to a human smuggling network. Uh, we moved fast uh, and, and successfully to, uh, to uh, successfully to disrupt it. So just want to be very clear of that. And we are being that you disrupted it. Are you saying that you know where all of the people this ISIS sympathizer snuck into the country are? If I can answer the question, I'm sure I'll touch on every everything that you want to ask me. So again, in, intelligence alerted us of this human human uh, smuggling network. We believe and we move fastly and we successfully disrupted it. So let's be very clear about that. And we are grateful. We are very grateful to the law enforcement for their quick work and their vigilance on this. Now, to your other part of the question, smugglers have been detained overseas, including one link to the foreign terrorist uh, organization. Uh, no sign, there is no sign that any, anyone moved by the smuggling network has terrorism connections, so I want to be clear there as well. And what we were able to do as precaution, uh, people brought here by smuggling network are being subject to extra vetting and are all in removal proceeding. And in addition to that, in addition to that, anyone coming across the border outside of the network uh, who matches the profile of those in the smuggling network is subject to uh, extra vetting, detained, and put in expedited removal uh, proceedings as well. You said that there's no sign of a plot, but isn't it true that the U.S. has to be right 
with preventing terrorist attacks 100% of the time. They only have to be right once. So let's be very clear. I want to be really clear here. We are committed. This is, this is a White House that is committed to making sure that we are protecting our homeland and also protecting the American people. That is our commitment. We will continue to be vigilant on that. And so want to be uh, incredibly clear uh, on this. And, uh, and, and we are thankful. We are grateful for our law enforcement who, uh, who acted very quickly here. And they are disrupted. They, dis they successfully disrupted uh, the smuggling network. We've seen human smuggling networks operated by the cartels for years. Why the sudden urgency with this one? We always have, we have always and will be and have been vigilant here when it comes to making sure that we are protecting our homeland. That is something that this president is committed to. That is something that uh, this administration is committed to. We will always be and we will continue to be. Let's not forget uh, that uh, this was successfully disrupted. Uh, and it was because of the quick act of our law enforcement that we are incredibly grateful to. Assumption to make. I mean, that's a ridiculous assumption to, to make. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Um, Eric Adams, the New York mayor, is saying about these migrants uh, in New York City, any plan that does not include stopping the flow at the border is a failed plan. So why aren't you guys stopping the flow at the border? We are stopping the flow at the border. If anything, the, what the president has been able to do on his own without the help of Republicans in Congress, something that he had to do on his own again because Republicans refuse uh, to give the funding necessary to deal with a situation, uh, immig a broken immigration system that has been broken for decades. They choose, what they choose to do is play politics, but the, pers the president has put a plan that is indeed, uh, the data showing is that it is indeed uh, um, stopping, slowing down the flow uh, of unlawful migration. And that is because of the work that this president continues to do without, without the help of Republicans. Okay, and okay, just one more. The president sure. said over the long weekend that he hasn't had the occasion to go to East Palestine. I just haven't been able to break. The derailment was on February 3rd. President Biden has not had a break since February 3rd. The president will go to East Palestine. He promised that he would, and he will. Uh, but, you saw him. On, uh, so he was not on a break when he was in Lake Tahoe? I will say this again. The president is going to go to East Palestine, as he has said that he is committed to do. You saw him just this Saturday visit uh, a rural area, right, that was uh, devastated. Some parts were devastated by uh, Hurricane Idalia, and he was there with the First Lady. They were able to hear f directly from the American people, and he was able to talk about what is it that they need? What is it, what else do they need from the federal government? So the President is going to go to East Palestine. I don't have a time or, or date to announce at this time, but he will go. Okay. Thanks, Green. Okay. Uh, thanks, Green. So what do you call it here at the White House when 10,000 people illegally cross the border in a single day. So what do you call it, Peter, when GOP puts forth a, a, a wait, no, As no, 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 you can't, Green? I'm answering, okay, we're going to move You're on. No, 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 we're moving on, Green, moving. in the back, no, no, you said you were right, stopping right, the flow the of the border. No, no, I tried to answer, uh, Peter, okay. I tried to answer the question, you stopped me, let's go. Okay, okay, so, there was footage yesterday of Border Patrol cutting some of the razor wire that Texas had installed. Um, Governor Abbott has vowed to reinstall it. They have picked their, his border czar has pictures of people taking fresh razor wire out to the border to reinstall it. Is there now a federal policy of removing the barriers that Texas is installing? So here's, and here's, here's what I, I'll say. I would have to look into that. I did so, see those reports yesterday. but. As it relates to Governor Abbott, we know what he has done this past uh, these past couple of years while this president uh, has been in office. He's he's turned this when it comes to the border. He's turned this into a political stunt, and that's what he's done over and over again. That's what I can speak to. Uh, I did see those reports. I would have to go back and, and act, get a sense from the team and give you a, an answer on that. Totally different subject. Sure. There are some new relaxed standards in town. Would President Biden ever show up to an official meeting? wearing shorts and a hoodie. You, you've, uh, 
I'm assuming you're talking about the Senate when you say he relaxed was standards. For a long time, used no, to be but I'm just, I just want to make Senate. sure we're clear what you're talking about here. Does he think these are appropriate you know, changes? You know the president. You've seen him. You've seen him for the past as vice president, as senator. Uh, he uh, he dresses better than than most of us here, <laughs> and and so uh, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to comment on uh, how Senate is running their business and the decision that they make. That is that is up to them. That and is not for us to decide. Last one. At a, at a fundraiser this week, President Biden told donors about how Charlottesville inspired his campaign and then according to the pool a few minutes later he told the story again nearly word for word what's up with that what I can tell you is um, and I'm gonna be careful not to talk about because this was a campaign uh, event uh, for this upcoming campaign obviously in 2024 so I'm not going to uh, speak to that put that out there for the Hatch Act what I can speak to is uh, look the president was making very clear why he decided to run in 2020 and 2019. Uh, he made it very clear as to what he saw in this country and what was going on. And he got 81 million votes, a historic amount of votes from Americans across the country who believed that this was a president who can help uh, get our, protect our democracy, uh, get our economy back on track, and, um, and what could be a leader and the adult in the room. And so that's what you saw. I'm not going to speak to uh, comments that were made and uh, uh, during a campaign uh, campaign event, uh, but I can certainly speak to uh, why the president is president today and why he decided uh, to take on this job. Uh, and uh, it is important for him to continue to deliver for the American people, and that's what he's going to do. Go ahead, Nancy. I know, I know your, your dad had some thoughts about our back and forth yesterday, so maybe we, sh we should try this again. I same question, <laughs> same question as yesterday. Can you repeat the question? What do you call it when 10,000 people illegally cross the border in a single day? So here's what I will say. Um, and you've heard, to say, you heard me say this a couple times, and I'll say it again because it is the facts. On day one, the first day of this president's administration, he put forth a comprehensive immigration reform that we believe we believe that was desperately needed for this country, right? As we know, and you've heard us say this many times before, we are dealing with a broken system. And no action was taken from Congress. And so what the president was able to do, he imposed consequences uh, for those who do not have the legal uh, basis to remain. And he has removed more than 250,000 individuals. This administration has done so uh, since May 12th. And so we've taken action the president has secured. He also secured record funding. And let, let's not forget this record funding that the president fought for over the last year or so uh, was, was opposed by the House Republicans. This is something that they opposed and didn't want to see. And so what it allowed us to do is actually hire uh, about uh, 25,000 more, uh, bring on uh, CBP agents, and really do something that was historic that we hadn't seen. And so. A broken system it's been broken for the past couple of decades the last administration certainly gutted the immigration system for four years that's what they did and you had speaker mccarthy and the republicans in congress who continuously continuously take step to undermine what is currently happening trying to undermine getting border security we saw that we saw that this week with the with the cr where they put forth another uh, another uh, piece of legislation to cut to cut, to propose continuing to uh, cut uh, uh, cut some important uh, resources that's needed, whether it's CBP, 800 fewer CBP is what they wanted to to do. 50,000 pounds of cocaine. That's what it would. That's what it would hurt. All right, in in um, in trying to prevent that from coming in. Right, when you think about more than 300 pounds of fentanyl, when you think about more than 700 pounds of heroin, more than 6,000 pounds of methamphetamine to enter the country, that's what they were trying to prevent uh, from the work that we're trying to do, prevent from coming into the country. So. We would love to do this in a bipartisan way, but we're not seeing that. We're seeing what we're seeing from House Republicans is wanting to defend, def defund, pardon me, DHS. But when you spoke last month yeah. and you said, we are stopping the flow at the border, is 10,000 migrants in a single day stopping the flow? What I will say is, I just mentioned 250 individuals have been, have been uh, stopped who do not have the legal pathway from coming in. That has been since May 12th. And, and as we are, you know, looking at Eagle Pass, and I know this is a, uh, this is a, uh, where, where, um, uh, uh, kind of the, 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 um, the issue is at the time, at, at the moment, uh, 
you know, CBP quickly surged resources and personnel to the area, and thanks to their great work, their great work, uh, were able to swiftly vet, vetted and processed into custody more than 2,500 individuals and cleared the area where migrants had congregated. And that's the work of our law enforcement. That's the work of our law enforcement at the border. Remember, House Republicans are trying to cut that. They're trying to cut. Thank you, Corrine. Would President Biden ever try to get out of a meeting by pulling a fire alarm? <laughs> are you talking about something specifically? A Democratic <laughs> member of Congress pulled a fire alarm around a series of votes. No fire. Is that appropriate? What I can tell you is uh, I have not talking to, spoken to the president about this, uh, and so just not going, just not going to comment. I will leave it up to. I know there's a House process moving forward right now. I'll leave it to the House. Okay. Uh, since President Biden is so pro-union. Is he okay with 75,000 health care workers possibly walking off the job this week? What I can tell you is that, and we, I've said this many times already this morning, the president believes all workers, all workers, including health care workers and those that make their work uh, possible, they deserve a fair pay and they, they deserve fair, a fair benefit. That's what the president believes. He believes that collective bargaining works. That is, we've seen that play out in the past even a couple of months. We think about the Teamsters. Uh, you think about the Teamsters and, and the UPS. You think about the West Coast ports, right? We see that play out. And so it is important uh, that, that, uh, that we, you know, we see that continue. And I'll have to, and I'll have to say, like, the, the Treasury Department uh, laid out recently a, a major report that unions and collective bargaining are good for the overall economy and help raise wages for everybody, whether they are a union member or not. And I think that matters. Would you consider joining them on the picket line if they strike? Look, I don't have anything else to, to share on, on the president's schedule. What I can say is that this, when, when we see this type of collective bargaining, when we see this type of, um, you know, the report that I just laid out, when, uh, when unions and, and, and unions do uh, collective bargaining, it actually helps our economy overall and it raises wages. And I think that's important for all, not just union members, also non-union members. And a couple days ago, uh, looters were uh, terrorizing businesses in Philadelphia. What is the White House doing about that? So obviously, uh, any coordinated theft uh, and vandalism that occurred in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia is, uh, is destructive and simply unacceptable. That's what we say. We've always said that. Any type of, uh, of vandalism, any type of violence, we certainly denounce that from here. Uh, the acts of, of uh, these individuals harmed local businesses, as we, you saw, as we saw in the communities that depend on them. But I also want to be clear because uh, the police, uh, the police commissioner in Philadelphia, did say, and he said this on the record, that looting was the act of opportunists uh, taking advantage of an unrelated protest. But obviously, obviously, and we have been very consistent here when it comes to any sort of vandalism, uh, certainly looting or any type of violence, we are going to, uh, we are going to simply. Uh, uh, condemn that and it is unacceptable. I know you're going to follow up on that. What's what's your question? Well, the first follow up would be how are you going to blame Republicans for this? Isn't DC run by a bunch of Democrats? I'm going to speak to what the president has done, right? The president has been very, very straightforward about what he has done to make sure that communities are safe. American Rescue Plan, not one Republican in Congress voted for it. Not one. There were billions of dollars in that plan, in that, in that act, to make sure communities across the country got funding so that they can indeed hire more police officers so that they can keep their communities safe. Republicans had nothing to do with that. They were not involved in that. They decided not to vote on the American Rescue Plan. That's just a fact. So if President Biden's policies are helping bring crime down, would he be comfortable with somebody borrowing his Corvette and parking it on the street overnight in Southeast DC? I'm not gonna get into hypotheticals. I'm just gonna get into the facts about what this president has done in this presidency. One thing that we're, somebody was asking me about bipartisanship, he was able, as it relates to guns, he was able to come together, right? We saw Democrats and Republicans come together and have the first piece of gun anti-gun violence uh, prevention legislation in 30 years. And that's something that this president was able to do. If a member of Congress is not safe on the streets of the nation's capital, who is? Look, we're grateful and relieved that the cong congressman is unharmed. We understand what communities are going through across the country, not just in DC, 
That's why the president took action very early on in his administration to get the American Rescue Plan done without the help of Republicans. That's why every time he puts forward his budget, he makes sure there are billions of dollars to deal with crime. That's just a fact. All you got to look is what the president has been able to do this past two years. There's always going to be work, more work to be done, but the fact is the president has taken action. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. The governor of Illinois has written to President Biden to say, the federal government's lack of intervention and coordination at the border has created an untenable situation for Illinois. Does anybody outside of the White House think the immigration policy is working? So here's what I can tell you. I just mentioned that the president requested $4 billion uh, it for a supplemental uh, funding to address what we're seeing at the border. Right? and uh, to manage what is happening currently at the, uh, the southwest border more specifically. And Republicans continue to block us. They do. They continue to block us. And without Congress, the President has taken action. He's taken action whether it is uh, whether surging resources to the border. We have removed and returned more than 250,000 uh, 50, people since May 12th, and working with partners and countries across the region to actually deal with this issue. So the President has continued to put, try to put forth uh, actions and ways to deal with what we're seeing at the border, and Republicans continue to block us. I just mentioned moments ago, like two weeks ago, they put forth a CR, a CR that would take away law enforcement, law enforcement at the border. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Kareem. As a candidate, President Biden didn't say there will not be another foot of wall constructed that uh, except what was appropriated in 2019. He said there will not be another foot of wall constructed in my administration. So something changed. What? You want us to break the law. Is that what you want? You want us to not comply with the law. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm you want, about but you want us to not comply it. with the law. You want us to not be in administrations that follow the law. You guys do law. this all the time. The student loans, uh, the student loan forgiveness program. Uh, you went to court to fight for that. If this is such a problem, building 20 miles of wall, why not just go to court? We went to Congress. The Congress appropriates why the funding. Not, why not Congress, fight them more? Congress appropriates the funding. We asked them to not use that funding for that particular purpose. They denied it, and now we're complying with the law. If you have to build a border wall, but you don't think that it's going to work, then once it's done, are you just going to tear it down? I'm not getting into hypotheticals from here. I'm just telling you what I can tell you from here. The facts are that DHS is complying with the law. This is from fiscal year. This was under fiscal year 2019 under Republican uh, leadership, and DHS is required to do this. The president asked multiple times of Congress to reappropriate. They did not, and we're not complying by the law. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Kareem. Does President Biden think the anti-Israel protesters in this country are extremists? What I can say is what we've been very clear about this. When it comes to anti-Semitism, there is no place. We have to make sure that we speak against it very loud uh, and, be, uh, and be very clear about that. Remember, what the president decided to, when the president decided to run for president is what he saw in Charlottesville in 2017, when we, he saw uh, neo-Nazis marching down the streets of Charlottesville uh, with vile, anti-Semitic uh, just hatred. And he was very clear then, and he's very clear now. Uh, he's taken an actions against this over the past two years, and he's continued to be clear. There is no place, no place for this type of vile and despite, despite this, this kind of rhetoric. And we hear you guys, though, talk about extremists all the time. It is usually about MAGA extremists. So what about these protesters who are making Jewish I've students feel very, unsafe very on college campuses? Are they extremists? I've been very, very clear. We are calling out any form of hate any form of hate. It is not acceptable. It should not be acceptable here. And we are going to continue to call that out. And let, and let me be very clear. This is a president that has continued to have that fight in his office, in this administration. You know, when he repealed Trump's Muslim ban on his very first, first day in office, that is something that this president did. Uh, he also established an inter-policy committee to counter Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, anti and related forms of bias and discrimination. We have taken this very, very, very seriously from the president all the way on down.
Does President Biden look at these anti-Israel protests on college campuses and think it's nice to see that the country's youth are so involved, or does he think the next generation is doomed? Here's the thing. There's no place for hate in America. But I'm no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there's no place for hate in America, and we condemn any anti-Semitic threat or incident in the strongest terms. And you heard me say at the top, we, we, I gave a message to students uh, who are feeling, who are feeling under threat right now, right? You know, we're tracking these threats very closely. We are there for them. Uh, no student should have to be able to go to class, live on campus in fear. And, you know, these incidents, these reported anti-Semitic incidents at schools and on campuses, that should not be. We have to condemn them. We have to condemn them. Catch okay. Thanks, Karine. Uh, the senators are having some talks this week about an immigration deal that would unlock uh, Ukraine aid. Is the White House plan to get involved with those? Do you think sit, on, sit in on them? I'm just not going to negotiate from here. Okay. You mentioned the president's excited to be celebra celebrating his birthday, but I'm curious. David Axelrod told the New York Times, quote, Biden thinks he can cheat nature here, and it's really risky. A, what's the president's response to David Axelrod? Does he respect his opinion? Does he think he's right? But also, I mean, is there a real alarm happening behind the scenes that the president is simply too old to stake around for another four years? No, there's no alarm happening behind the scenes. Not, there, I, I can only speak sure. behind the scenes here. There's no alarm happening behind the scenes, and I'm certainly not going to uh, comment on uh, everybody who has something to say. Uh, uh, what I, I, know what, I mean, David Axelrod well, is, I didn't, is, is I, I didn't say that. I didn't, I, yeah. Nowhere in my response to you that I said that. I said I'm just not going to comment on everyone that has a, that has a comment to say. They're going to speak for themselves. I'm going to speak for the president. And here, what I'll say is, look, um, and also, it's just not my job. It's not my job to think to, to think through or to um, uh, to tell people what to think, right? Whether it's an, uh, the American American people out there or uh, or a a you know, political analysts, or, or as your question is about David Axelrod, it's just not my, my, my place to speak to that. What I can speak to is how we see this, how what our perspective is. Our perspective is that it's not about age; it's about the president's experience. That's what we believe, and it's you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding, right? The president has used his experience to pass more bipartisan legislation in recent time than any other president. That's just a fact. That is something that we have seen this president do, and that's because of his experience. He's been able to manage multiple uh, multiple foreign policy challenges. That's He's been able to do that. That's because of his experience. He's been able to create jobs, raise wages, and lower inflation, right? And that is also, that is, the proof is in the pudding, right? We see that in the data. We see that where we are today than where we are, than where we were when the president walked into the administration. So what we say, is we have to judge him by what he's done, not by his numbers. And and one more thing I will add, this is the first president ever that's been able to go to an active war zone without our military, uh, you know, c controlling what's happening on the ground. And so, look, um, I would put the president's stamina, the president's wisdom, ability to get this done on behalf of, of uh, the American people against anyone, anyone on any day of the week. Right, Thank Thanks, you Green. On lowering prices, you said earlier that the actions the president has taken have worked. So is it your sense that when people were home for Thanksgiving catching up with their family members, they were saying to each other, can you believe how much more affordable things have gotten? So honestly, I wouldn't, uh, I, I hear the question, but I want to make sure this is very clear. We take that very seriously. We take what families families the decisions that they make at their kitchen table whether it's at whether it's during Thanksgiving or whether it is every month as they're trying to make hard decisions uh, about how they move forward with taking care of their family we take that very seriously it's not a joke to us it is important to us this is the president who talks about it in a very personal way when he talks about what what families have to go through working families middle class families and that's why he's taking actions that he has and so look um, the fact is the data shows that the economy is improving. 
The data shows that households remain in a strong financial position. Household wealth is, 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 is at a record high, with lower income households seeing the largest gain since the pandemic. Those are indeed what we're seeing. But we don't, we don't take lightly, we actually we do not take lightly what Americans and families continue to feel. That's why the president at 2 o'clock is going to talk about what the actions that he's taking to continue to lower costs. But why do you think it is that when you say the economy is improving and President Biden says the economy is improving, that a majority of Americans outside of this building are not buying it? So here's the thing. When we walked into this administration, the economy was on a tailspin. A tailspin. That is the fact. Because of the last administration, because of the Trump administration, because of how they dealt with, uh, with d dealt with COVID and the pandemic, because they didn't have a comprehensive plan. The president came in, he passed the American Rescue Plan, which was able to get the economy back on its feet, which was able to open up small business. Well, small businesses were able to open up, schools were able to open up, and we understand what Americans have been feeling over the last two, three years. It's going to take some time. We get that. It's going to take some time, but it does not take away how we have seen the economy getting back on its feet. We actually had to fix the problem that we saw that the last administration left us. But almost three years in office, inflation is up over 17% since President Biden came here. And inflation, you're saying that's still Trump's fault. Inflation, inflation is moderating because of the actions that this, per, this president has taken. Doesn't because that mean that prices because are going up slower. They're still high. It's going down. The prices are going down. If you look at where, for example, for a perfect example, I mean, I just talked about last week how turkey prices, the tur cost for turkeys is going down, the cost for eggs is going down because of the actions that were taken. Which I just talked about supply chain and how that affects the economy. And that's because of the president's action that he's taken. And if you think about gas prices, it's down by $1.70 since its peak, since its peak, because of the actions that this president has taken. So we understand that people are still not feeling it. We get that. But does it mean that we're not going to continue to talk about it? Does it mean that the president at 2 o'clock is not going to talk about how he's lowering costs? Right? And let's not forget what Republicans are doing on the other side of, of uh, again, Pennsylvania Avenue. They're trying to increase health care costs. They want to get rid of Medicare. They want to get rid of uh, Social Security. That is something that we saw them try to do at the State of the Union. Right? We, they do that over and over and over again. They want to make sure the millionaires and billionaires are, are actually uh, getting the benefits, right? And so that's not, that's not our way. Our way is to build the middle class from the bottom up, middle out, and the president believes in that. He talks about it. You're going to hear him talk about it in about an hour, and that's going to be our focus. I think I get it. Yep, yep. Thank you. Are you I'm surprised that I'm calling you? <laughs> <laughs> Just one question. Does sure. the Department of Education have any guidelines to ensure that schools receiving federal funding have reasonable protections for students from threats of violence, harassment, intimidation as part of their code of conduct? So hmm. reasonable protections in order to get the federal funding. So I don't, I would have to go back or refer you to the Department of Education. That's such a specific question. So I just would have to go to the Department of Education because I don't know if which programs you're specifically talking about or how that works. So I just need to. Related go. to the university president's uh, testimony and how, you know, their, the university presidents were saying that their codes of conduct may not um, hmm. designate any of the language, the infantata language, as. Um, against their rules unless it turned into well, so well, look I, I as far as it relates to funding and how that works I would have to certainly uh, refer you to Department of Education we have been very clear you heard me yesterday uh, about how we feel when um, when we see hatred uh, the way that we have seen go up in in a community like the Jewish community anti-semitism we're gonna call that out it is unacceptable we're not we're going to have the moral clarity here this president has had moral clarity on that and so we're gonna to continue to be steadfast and call that out and say anti-semit anti-semitism is unacceptable okay, Michael, thank you. Okay. Um, will the White House announce Hunter Biden's presence on Marine One moving forward uh, that's something that we've never done that this is the family the family gets to uh, travel with uh, with the president, and and that's been the case with every other president, uh, and so it's not something that uh, we have done or or we would be doing moving forward. 
The reason I ask is just the, the legal trouble he's facing, it, leaving him off the list would appear to sound like an effort to conceal him. Um, at, and I guess the question that it begs is why does the president think it's appropriate that taxpayer dollars should be used to fly him around when he's been indicted and justified a congressional subpoena? So I will refer you to uh, Hunter's personal representatives as it relates to any questions about uh, the legal affairs. Uh, but as you know, as you know, as it relates to the past couple of days, as I just stated to your colleague, uh, is that, uh, you know, um, the president and their family were uh, obviously, uh, it was a somber, a somber anniversary uh, that they were recognizing. Uh, and uh, so you could imagine what that is like uh, for them. And, um, and I'll say lastly, and I've said this many times before, the President and the First Lady love their son very, very much. But as it relates to anything uh, in regards to his legal affairs, I would have to uh, certainly um, refer you to his uh, representatives. I just don't have anything else to add on and that. And real quickly on Bidenomics, you know, the White House is trying to sell this Bidenomics message heading into um, the election year. But we have a new Fox poll, and it shows that nearly half of voters, 46%, say the administration's policies have hurt them. And voters don't see the economy getting any better. They're twice as likely to see it getting worse next year. Why is that? So I'll say this, and we've talked about this many times, right? Um, the last few years have been challenging for the American people. We know that coming out of the pandemic. When the president walked into this administration, the economy was in a tailspin. It was. And so the president did everything that he can to make sure that we get this economy back on track. And we understand, we understand that Americans, you know, feel like things are still unaffordable. We get that. Uh, and that is something that the president has said himself very recently. And that's why he's going to continue. When it comes to, that's why the Inflation Reduction Act is so important. Matter of fact, no Republican voted on that act. If anything, they're trying to repeal some really important provisions that deals with lowering the prescription uh, drugs, right? That deals with lowering health care, that deals with lowering energy costs. And so that is something that the president signed, and only Democrats voted for it. No Republicans did. And it's going to help the Amer American people. And so so there are, you know, there are historical actions that this president has taken that has shown, the data shows, that the economy is in a better place. But I understand, we understand that Americans don't feel it right now. That's why we're going to continue to talk about junk fees, making sure that that is uh, something that we deal with, right? Making sure that uh, we're beating Big Pharma and lowering uh, drug costs for Americans. So there are ways that we're going to continue to make sure that the number one thing when it comes to Bidenomics that the president deals with, uh, lowering costs, uh, we're going to put that front and center. Matter of fact, the president's going to be in Milwaukee, Wisconsin tomorrow. You'll hear directly from him. He'll talk about Bi Bidenomics. He'll talk about how small businesses is at the pillar of Bidenomics and how important it is. We have seen record, record application, more than 14 million applications uh, for people wanting to start a small business. And that is because Bidenomics is indeed working. Thanks, everybody.